Josh comes. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Come on, you can do better than that. Good morning, everybody. You guys got to remember, I'm a coach, man. Like, we got to get into this. Like, let's go. You know, it's funny. Um, we're talking about today is, is suffering. It's great. It's a beautiful thing. And I think a lot of times we, uh, we all suffer, right? We all go through things. So I started uh, working out again this week. I, I haven't, uh, I've always, I'm always kind of a runner. I kind of do like little bits of running. But I started working out with weights again this week with a, 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 man, a young man that I used to like. Um, <clears throat> I don't really like him right now. But anyways, uh, I won't give out names. He knows who he is. And, um, but anyways, so we're, we're working out, and, and I've, I, I kinda, I'm the kind of person that I, when I'm working out, I like to have someone like on top of me and kind of coming up with the workouts and saying, just go and do it. But I whine the whole time I work out. I just got to be honest with you, I whine the whole time. I'll do it, but I whine. Anyways, so we're going, and he comes up with this insane workout. Like, I'm thinking, hmm, well, we'll, we'll try. So we do it, and um, I, I'm feeling great. Like, I'm like, yeah, I'm getting through this, and, you know, I'm, I'm feeling good. Until the, the second day. You know how it's like the second day after you work out? It's like, why in all of creation did I even think of doing that? Like, my body hurts. I can't move. I knew it was bad. In the middle of the night, I, I actually turned over and felt my legs hurt. I was like, oh, this is going to be a bad morning. <laughs> So I'm suffering right now. So if you see me moving a little slowly, it's because, you know, I did, uh, I, I, you know, I'm a year older. And I know, you know, being 49 is weird because all the folks that are in the older generation or have the mature generation look at you and go, oh, you're still a youngster. And all the students that I hang out with, you know, youth ministry and, and college ministry, they're like, you're old. So, like, am I old or am I young? I'm kind of confused. But, you know, you're not old enough to say you're old, and you're, not, and you're too old to say you're young. And so we're in the middle section, Tony and I. He's, he's much older than I am, though. He's, I'm 49. He just turned 50. So he's way older than I am. But anyways, but it's funny because, you know, we're, as we're going through Romans, we're walking through Romans chapter 8. And it, as we're seeing, what, what's happening is we're getting the idea that, we have, when you come to Christ, when you give your life to Jesus Christ, you come from death to life. There's, there's a, a serious change, and something happens. And we're getting the ideas of, six, chapter 6 and 7 was kind of giving the things of what we came from, the, the, the old stuff to the new stuff. And it's saying stuff like you were, you were a slave to, to the law, but now you're free in Christ. And, and, and you look at that difference of the death and life. Well, I always wanted to, to start, we always want to start with chapter 1, this, this verse that we think is so important to share with every time we talk in Romans. And it's Romans chapter 1, verse 16. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. So understanding that the gospel is the power of God. It, it, this word, why we walk through the word line upon line, precept upon precept, because it's the word of God that brings the trans, trans uh, it transforms us internally and brings salvation to us. And so I want to encourage you to continue to remember what this is all about. It's the fact that Paul is saying, I'm not ashamed of what Christ has done. And in fact, no matter what happens to me in this earth, on this planet, in this life, I know the focus is the gospel because it's all that matters. It's all that matters. Well, last week, Pastor Tony uh, finished up, or he, he was in the beginning of, of chapter 8. And a week before that, we finished up chapter 7. And we're going we're gonna to look in chapter 8. We're going to start um, right here in verse 17. And it says, and if children heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. So knowing that we're heirs, yes, in Christ, but it's the suffering of understanding what he has been through. It's laying your life down to the fact that Christ has suffered and paid the price, but he's saying you have to lay down your life in place and let him come and take over. And then he starts off in verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So it's that fact that, yeah, you're suffering now, but look at what's going to come, right? My, my muscles are sore right now to the point where I can't hardly walk, 
But I know as I continue, now if I stop now and I don't continue working out, what's going to happen? I'm going to have to go through this again. And I'm going to have to suffer. It's the, the muscles are trying, and, and if you know anything about working out, it actually, it's tearing your muscles. It is destroying your muscles so your muscles can get stronger. It's the same thing here. Is what he's saying is the suffering we're going through is nothing compared to what is about to come, which is the glory of God. Now, the suffering that we have, this, this life, as you get older, you know the, the groans, right? We're going we're gonna to see where uh, the creation groans. We're going to see that we groan and that the Holy Spirit himself groans. And, and, and as you get older, you know, you're like, yeah, I've been groaning a lot, right? But it's not the groaning of our body, but it's the groaning of our redemption that we are Christians. We know Christ, but one day we are going to be complete with him because we, we're looking at this world and what is there not to groan about? Right? I mean, there's a lot of tough stuff happening in our world. So as he talks about the suffering to glory, the fact that I am going to suffer, but in the long run, it's going to be amazing. You know, you think about so many parallels of this in the world, right? And in, in what we, in our life, you think of childbirth and, and the hard part of the, of the birth. Now, praise, you know, ladies, I want to tell you something. I, I, that's a part where I'm praise God. I didn't have to go through that. I watched my wife go through that. And guys, I'm going to tell you, it's wild. It's pretty brutal. But yet the glory of that baby that you hold in your hands and God brings that glory and you, you have that, that daughter or that son and, and, and the pain, you still, you know, it's like, yeah, you remember it, but you know what it's for. It's for life. The true new life that comes into the world, that's what it's about. That's what he's talking about. This suffering that we are going through it's really nothing compared to the glory of God one day that we're going to be with him face to face. That's going to be amazing. And that's the purpose, what we've got to look at. But what we do in this world is we look at the suffering all the time. And that's what we focus on. The woe is me, right? Or the, or the it's not fair. Or the I can't believe this is happening in our world. It shouldn't be this way. Or the, right? Isn't that what we focus on a lot of times? Instead of the glory of God and what God is doing and what he wants to do in it and through it, that's our focus. It needs to be because if you focus on the suffering and you focus on the pain, you will never see the light. You'll never see it. Again, back to my silly example, if I focus on my pain and I stop and I don't continue to work out, it's not going to benefit me in the long run. But it's the continuous going after what, what I have to do to get stronger and to get better and to get, and to, and to get in shape or whatever you want to call it. You know, listen, at 49, I'm not looking, you know, to, to uh, go and, you know, run marathons and be ripped. I, I don't care about that anymore. I just don't, I want to be strong. I want to be able to do things that I used to be able to do and continue to do the things so I don't get weaker. And all of a sudden, you know, the less you work out, the more your body falls apart. It's crazy. And the more you exercise, the more you continue in it, the amazing how God just stronger, you become stronger and you continue in it. And that's this... That's the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared. There's no comparison with what God's going to do. So whatever you're going through today, I want to encourage you. Think of what is going to happen. Let's go to, uh, we're going to go to a couple different scriptures here. We're going to go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> Starting in verse 5. Actually, let's start in verse uh, 4. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled, that will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
And so this first part, he's talking about an inheritance that when you come to Christ, when you say yes to what God has done for you and what, at that price that he's paid on the cross, and you say yes to that, you actually are a part of the family of God and you get an inheritance, an everlasting inheritance. But he's saying that, that what's going to happen until then, because yes, you are a Christian, you are God's child, but it doesn't mean it's over. It means that actually he's, you're going to go through various trials. You're going to struggle. You're going to go through the suffering. Why? Because God wants to be glorified in the things that the world thinks there is no chance of glory, which is the suffering, which is the, the, the tough things of this world. Uh, Christians, I think, a lot of times in, in our culture today think if you're a Christian, everything's going to work out and everything's going to be perfect and you're going to get whatever you want. That is not the gospel. The gospel actually teaches he can give you things, he can bless you with stuff, but the gospel is the fact that Christ has already paid the price, but he wants to transform you. He wants to work in you. He wants to do something that only he can do, which is show up in your life in ways that you think, no way is it possible. So he continues in that. And then he says, you're protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed. Now, Think about who they're talking to. Like, we can go back, we can read Romans, you can read Peter. You always got to remember who they're talking to. They're talking about the believers of the time. These guys are being persecuted greatly. Some of them are being beaten for their faith. Some of them are being killed. In fact, they're spread throughout the land because of the persecution. And when he's telling them, listen, you're suffering, you're going through. Understand, it's nothing compared to what God's going to do. And listen, he's preparing you for something. He's preparing you for whatever he wants to do in this life through you to speak to other people. That's the part of, of God that we don't like talking about a lot of times, but it's so clear in Scripture that he is going to transform you. In that transformation, it's going to hurt sometimes. He's molding you like clay. He's taking out that garbage that you don't need, that sinfulness, that selfishness, and he's putting the Spirit of God in you more and more. And the more you realize who God is, the more you realize you need him more every day. It's that process. It's that, that sanctification is a, is a word that's used in the Scriptures. It's that process of being made holy. So this suffering that we are having in this world is nothing compared to the glory and the end result. It's going to be awesome. And we can talk about how awesome it's going to be, but we don't really know. We can never really put word, English words to the understanding of how amazing it's going to be in heaven. <laughs> you know, you can try, but you can't do it. Go back to Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 19 now. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. So he tells us the suffering. Now he's getting into the glory. He says the ancient, the creation itself is waiting for it. And then it says, For this creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Now, you look back in, in Genesis, and you can see when, when man sinned, Creation was actually subject to, to futility, to the, the sinfulness, to um, things. And, and, and what it's saying is that word futility, it, it's, it's talking about that it had a purpose. Creation had a purpose. When sin came into the world, God actually subjected the world to uh, corruption, really. And it became corrupted because it had a purpose. The planet was here, guys, for us, by the way. God created earth for man. It's not the other way around. And I think that's where our world is kind of getting this a little jacked up, okay? It's, you know, you'll hear different things of, of people will say, well, there's too many people on the planet. We need, to, we need to eliminate people from the planet so the planet can be better. The planet was made for us, not us for the planet. And you've got to understand that. That's where the twistedness, where, where, again, if you don't see that God created this for a reason, this planet that we live in now, we have to be good stewards. I'm not saying that we should just be willy-nilly, but I think we have to understand that the mindset of the world is not the correct mindset. We should be good stewards. We should take care of this planet. But guess what? What we're seeing right now is what the Bible actually teaches us. The stuff that's happening with the, with the different weather and the different earthquakes and all these different things and, and the thing that's happening. That's God actually trying to wake us up. And he says in the end times, there's going to be different weather and different things. And we're going to see, actually, this is talking about, this is when he says that revealing of the sons of God, and then he says in the glory of the children of God, 
That's actually talking about end times when we actually go and are with Christ, when he takes us up, and then he returns again. That's talking about end times. And if you do not see, in my opinion, this is Josh Sanoga, but if you don't look at the signs of our world today and see that we're not in end times, I don't know what you're looking at. Now, I know people want to say, well, they've been saying that forever. Yeah, there's a guy named Paul. He said that. So how should, and he tells us to be anxious and be ready for the coming of the Lord. In fact, this word, which is interesting, what, what it says, be anxious, longing for creation. What, what creation is doing, it's like, you're, you ever like been waiting for somebody and you're kind of like looking, you're maybe looking over a crowd or you're looking over the horizon and you want to, it's like you're on your tippy toes and you're kind of like, you want to look just a little bit more, you know, like it's going to help you, but you want to get a little higher so you can see a little further. You're waiting for that thing to come, whatever it is. Maybe it's your child coming home from a, from a college uh, holiday or maybe it's whatever. You know, I know right now Zeke's in college and every time he's on his way home, we're like waiting at the window. He was driving home for uh, for a week, you know, for Christmas. And it was like, he's coming. And we're like, are you here yet? He's like, I'm coming. Will you leave me alone? And we're looking out the window. Like, is he coming? I've got my dog next to me. Do you see him yet? And my dog's like, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm looking, right? He has no idea. It's like you're eagerly waiting for that thing to come. That's what creation is doing. That word in the Greek is like, it's like, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. And, and the creation itself is crying out. I wanted to find a video because it's interesting. If you look online, now so, a lot of the videos are, there's a lot of um, profanity in it, so I couldn't share any of the videos. But there's, there's times in different places around the world that there's been videos of the earth itself making groanings. And it, it does weird noises. And they don't know where it's coming from. They, the, the one guy was saying, and again, in the profanity, that he's, he's videoing it. And he's going, I don't know what this is. What is this? And he says, it sounds like it's coming from the ground. And it's what it is. It's earth is groaning. Because it knows what the end is there, and it wants the redemption, just like we are groaning. That anxious longing. It is because right now, it is, it is uh, brought, that, that God has given it the futility. The futility, it's like, it's almost like it can't get to where it was meant to be. The earth is at that point. Because of the sinfulness, because of what we're at. But it's waiting for the children of God to be revealed. But it says, go over to 21, that the creation itself will be set free from its slavery to the corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Just like what Pastor Tony was talking about last week in the first part of, of chapter 8, it's talking about we are slaves to sin or to Christ. And the question is, are you falling back to the slavery of your sin, or are you letting Christ constantly transform you? Listen, I don't know what's going on in your life. But as a pastor, I know what it's like to sin. Because we still struggle with sin as pastors. We think sometimes that these ministers of the gospel have something special. We do. It is God's calling, but we still struggle with this life. We too are groaning and want the return of Christ. We should be looking and desiring that because we know what the outcome is. And it's way better than this earth. To live is Christ, to die is gain. To live is Christ, to die is gain. I want to live this life in Christ so much that my focus is heavenward because I know one day it's going to be way better than this. But here's the purpose is I want everyone to know how good it's going to be and I want everyone to come with me. Everyone. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. I want everyone to come to the saving knowledge of Christ so you too can have that heart of heaven words. You're going heavenward. You're going purpose of the of the gospel and i i hope you see that so creation's crying out its name so the beginning of this is suffering and glory and now the corruption is coming that corruption that the earth is that the corruption is going to the freedom verse 22 for we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now and not only this but we also, also we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Okay, so look at verse, again, end of 19, that, that the creation's waiting for the uh, revealing of the Son of God. Uh, verse 21, it says uh, that the creation is waiting for the glory of the children of God. And then it says that 
we are groaning together with creation, what? Waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. This part where it says the first fruits of the Spirit, when you accept Christ, you get the Holy Spirit. God comes in your life and he starts changing something. That's when you know. I, I had a couple of young men come into my office this week, and I have to share this because they were being real with me, and they were shared some things, and they said, you know, I know the Bible. In fact, the Bible, one kid said, the Bible's the only thing that really actually completely makes sense. He said, and I know it, but I don't know if I really know it. And the other kid was like, yeah, what he said. And I'm like, what did he just say? And they were like, you know, like, I know it, but I, I just want to know it. I, I just want to know it. I want to know that I know. And I'm like, well, what do you know? I was just messing with them. I was like, so what do you know? And they're like, well, again, We've been taught this stuff all our lives. We have great families. We're, they're teaching us the Bible, and, and they're, they're giving it to us. And we go to Lima Christian School, and we've been, we go to chapels, and we hear about the gospel all the time. But there's something like inside that I feel like I'm missing. And I said to him, I said, guys, I want to tell you, there are feelings involved. There are. And, and the Spirit works in so many ways sometimes that you don't even understand. But sometimes we just have to put our heart and our trust in the truth. It's a truth of God's word that actually transforms us to the point where one day you're going to see the spirit work in such a way and you're going to go, wow, I know he's real, but yet now I know he's real because of what he's doing in my, our midst or what he's doing in our lives. But sometimes, guys, you don't get that ooey gooey feeling. Sometimes you don't get that, oh, you know, like, yeah. Now, I know, I know you guys, if you're around me enough, the young adults and, and the youth and, and some, some of you folks and you hear me on Sunday mornings, I have an excitement about the gospel. But, man, there's sometimes, man, it's, it's just not there. But those are the days that actually I know the truth even more because I know what to trust in and I know what to go after. And it's the truth of God's word, the fact that I will be redeemed, the fact that my body will be transformed one day completely with God, that I'm going to be face to face with him. So how do I know? Well, I told them, what did you say in the very beginning of it? They said, well, I said that I believe in the word of God and I believe in Jesus Christ. Well, then you know. And now it's seeking after him day in, day out. The groaning is what we're all dealing with. The doubts are the groaning. The wondering, it's the groaning. You're groaning internally because you know this isn't it. You ever go through life and you're like, this can't be it. I love the answer is, it's not. That's the best part. Young people, I know right now what you're thinking in your minds. I want to do something great for the Lord. I want to do something amazing. Yes, go after that. Go after that heart. Go after that purpose. But understand, sometimes it is the mundane. It is the day in, day out. It's the process. At West Virginia University, the football team, they used to say this all the time. Trust the process. You know? <laughs> yeah, you know, like trust. The, and they said it all the time. I'm like... Oh my gosh, it's, it's, it's the point. Trust the process. That's the process of the gospel in you. It's the process of God moving you and transforming you that one day the redemption will come. And some people say right now, I want Jesus to return today because I hate this life. I understand. But God wants you to love this life because he has you here for a purpose and a reason. He wants you to love others. Not necessarily this life because the life to come is way better. But guess what? You are here for a reason. So that someone can learn of the hope that is in you. And then he talks about hope, this next verse. He says, for in hope we have been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he has already seized? But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. That hope that I, I've never seen God. I, I, I don't know what it is what it's going to what he really is going to look like i know we have the bible and we're going after it what is god what's the end times what's what's heaven going to look like I, again we have glimpses but what we do know is he is the god of salvation he is the one that sacrificed everything for us there's a little bit of a of a glimpse of this we're going to go all the way back in isaiah and we're going to go back into isaiah uh chapter 11 i want i want to show you a little bit of what we see here in uh, verse 6. <clears throat> There's going to be a peace in the land that we've never seen. And this is really what creation was meant to be in the beginning. There wasn't strife. Before Adam's sin and Eve's sin, there was no strife. There was just perfection. 
God created the earth in perfection. Everything was amazing. It, it, it actually, I mean, even the canopy uh, above the atmosphere, it was, it was a perfect, you know, everyone like, you know, I, it would be nice to just have, we always talk about, I don't, I don't know about you guys, but I do, I always talk about that perfect weather, you know. Like I like, I like winter. I don't mind winter for like a day. Um, I, don't, I don't mind it. Like the, the thing I struggle with with, uh, with upstate New York because I've lived in Tennessee, I've lived in West Virginia, and now I'm back. I grew up in upstate New York, just because people think I'm from West Virginia. I'm not. I do say y'all, but I am from uh, upstate. I grew up in Greece. The thing I struggle with in New York, and I don't know if you do, but it's like the sun disappears for months at a time, and that drives me insane. I'm just like, I want sun. I want something. I just want brightness. And when there's a bright day, you ever, you know, you ever like wake up, and it's like a bright day in the middle of the winter, you're like, it's gorgeous out. Oh, it's still cold, right? And you're like, but, but there's something about the sun that just wakes you up, right? And, and you want that perfect weather. You know, people say San Diego. I've never been to San Diego, but they say that's a perfect weather. Okay, whatever it is, but that perfection was in the beginning. God created it that way. It was perfect. You didn't need air conditioning. You didn't need heat. It was just a perfect temperature. And then God allowed man to choose to go against him. And then the corruption happened. Sin came into the world, and we have what we have. But let's look at verse 6. This is what it's going to be like of chapter 11 of Isaiah. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will graze. Their young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw with the ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra. And the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Then in that day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal for the peoples. And his resting place will be glorious. There's going to be peace. There's not going to be strife even in the creation itself. It's going to be purposeful. You think about these things. These are, you know, these are things that eat each other. And in in God's planet, they're going to be hanging out and chilling and relaxing. And we're going to be able to, my wife can't wait one day because she wants to really be able to hang out with a lion. I think she really wants to pet one and she wants to, but she doesn't want to be eaten by him. She just wants to hang out with him. Or a, a cheetah, her favorite, you know, she just wants to be around these big cats. She's a, one of those cat people, you know, kind of weird. But anyways, they, no, but she, she you know, that, that's going to be amazing. We're going to be able to hang out there. We're not going to have to worry of death or of disease or of pain. It's going to be gone. That's what we're groaning for. That's what we're looking for. That's the best of the best. And that's with our inheritance, guys. How do we not encourage each other with these things? How do we not say one day the groaning's going to be gone? Our bodies are going to be perfect. We are going to be one with God. We're going to see him face to face. How do we not do that? We just go, oh, yeah, no, I'm a Christian. Just mundane. Just walking through life. I'm moral. I haven't smoked. I haven't drank. I really haven't had fun for years. Like, I don't want that life. I don't. I want life that there's something about it that we just are looking forward to. We are looking forward to the glory of God. Right? It's like that when that when that when your wife or when that baby's coming and they're in child, it's like, oh my gosh. The dad gets like all fight, like, what do I do now? You know, the dad's brain just goes mush, you know, like, oh yeah, the 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 I gotta get close. I don't know what to do because my wife always tells me what to do, and in this moment I'm supposed to do and I don't know what to do, right? I mean, okay, maybe I was the only one, but you're excited, you're anticipating, you're looking forward to it. I always tell this story when Zeke came, uh, they had a C-section, and, and Janine gave birth, and Zeke is there on the warming table, and, and I, I, Michael Jr. actually is a comedian, he's a Christian comedian, he talks about this, that happened to him with his daughter, and I remember walking up, you, I just said the goofy, I'm a goofy person anyways, but in, the, in that point, I walked up to the table, like my son's going to talk back to me, and I was like, welcome to the world, Ezekiel Sonoga, 
Like, is that the dorkiest thing you've ever had heard a dad say? It was like so, like, and you know what he did? He, he, he looked for my voice. He turned his head. Now, the craziest part is a baby cannot see very far. You know, their eyes are still developing. But his head turned. He stopped crying. And he looked for my voice. That's what we need to be looking for is the Father's voice. Is the redemption of our bodies, is the redemption of what God is calling us to. That's the hope of our calling. That's the purpose of what we do this for, guys. It's not to be the miserable Christians, but it's to be the joyful one to tell everyone that we know where we're going. We know the end because we've read the book and we should encourage each other with it. That not to be afraid that this is happening in our world, but be excited that yes, it could be tomorrow. I don't know if it's tomorrow, but one day, and I think it's sooner than others, and I'm going to keep screaming it from the, from the rooftops, but I'm telling you this, that he will return very soon. My question is, are you going with him? Because I know I'm going. Not because of who I am, but because of what he is, and because of the redemption of what Christ has done for me and in me. And I'm going to tell you, today is the day of salvation. Today's the day to know that you know, because just because he is the one who did it all. Today's the day to know. Not tomorrow. Not right before. But now. Let us encourage each other with these things. Going back to Romans. You know, it's interesting. I was uh, listening to a pastor this week. And I love this. This is... This is one of those motivational things for me every day. I try to find something just to motivate me because I'm kind of one of those guys. I know that's a shocker to you, but I am a motivating. I want to be motivated. But this is talking about this whole plan and understanding what the Spirit's job is because it's talking, these next couple of verses is going to talk about the Spirit groaning for us. The Father made the plan. The Son made it possible, and the Spirit is making it work. Let me read that again, just in case you're not catching that. The Father made the plan, the Son made it possible, and the Spirit is making it work. The Spirit's job is to be in you and, and literally transforming you and helping you and, and, and encouraging you and lifting you up in the times when you feel like you can't and helping you understand you can one more day. Because God has a purpose for your life. That redemption story is what it's all about. Let's go back to Romans chapter 8, verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. You know, there's a couple of different places in the Bible that says, if you don't know, ask. It tells us that, right? It's telling us right here, are you weak? Good, because the Spirit wants to make you strong. Paul said, I praise God for my weakness because in my weakness, he is shown and he is glorified. Are you weak? I'm glad you're admitting it. I'm glad, I'm glad you're opening up and saying finally that you can't figure it out. Praise God. That's where God wants you because he wants to strengthen you. Look at, in the same way, the spirit also helps our weakness for we do not know what to pray as we should. Guys, I want to tell you, I know some of us, the hardest thing for us to do is pray. I get it. But just be in the position to pray. The Holy Spirit will take over in those times. I don't know what to pray. Don't worry about it. He's got it. Remember when Moses, God said he, he's going to use Moses. Moses said, I can't talk. What did, what did God, oh, you can't, I didn't know that. Oh, okay, we can't talk. Well, we'll pick somebody else. No, God said, I will be your mouthpiece. God doesn't give us, a, you know, there's no excuses. Because God's the one that created us. God's the one that saved us. And God's the one that's going to do it through us, through the Holy Spirit. Now, look at this. When you don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit will pray for you. He says he intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. He's interceding. Jesus, it talks about how Jesus intercedes for us. Guys, the Holy Spirit is the one that is making things right in us. Stop trying to do it on your own. That's the problem. We pray like this, God, I want to do these things, so you give me the power to do these things. No. Stop praying like that. Go back to the Our Father, right, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray. What, in there does it say, okay, what you got to do is get all of your problems, and you got to figure out how to figure them out, and then you got to say, God, you do these things to help my problems. Is that what it says? 
But isn't that the way we pray? Okay, maybe I'm the only one that prays that way. I'm sorry. I've got to learn. But guess what? We do, right? No. Stop trying to figure it out. Say, God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And even when I don't know what to pray, say, God, take over. Because I know you have a better plan for me than I have anyways. I trust you. He's groaning. So uh, we see this, that the creation groans, we groan, and the best part is the Spirit groans for us. And he who searches the hearts knows that the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now, Josh, how do I know the will of God? Well, the Word of God is the key. It's the Word of God. We've got to know the Word of God. Now, do I have to have it memorized? No, but man, seek after it. Read it. It's not hard to read it. Sometimes it is. I've got to be honest with you. Sometimes, you know, I've told you this many times. Sometimes I, I get it. But just read it. And, and, and let the thing penetrate your heart. And pray before you read it. Read it. Then pray again. And then read it again. And then once you've read it all the way through, read it again. Because the word of God is a thing, I want to tell you, if you're, if you're struggling, go to Psalms. See how David struggled. See how these guys were struggling in their lives. It's not always a beautiful thing, but sometimes I, I want to tell you, it's the answer. And when you read through it and you see some of the guys struggling, how do I know the will of God? I read it, and then I let the Spirit take over so he can apply it in my life. But the, sa- the, the Spirit intercedes for us. He's praying for us. He's seeking God on our behalf. That's a part of the inheritance. See, when you don't have Christ, you have a brokenness between you and God because your sin is kind of messes things up. In fact, it tells us in Isaiah that he can't hear us because of our sin, right? There is no communication. I love when, when non-believers say, well, I'm praying for you. Okay, good. I mean, what? but I don't really know if you know who you're praying to, let alone what you're praying about. And I think that's the interesting part because we can't pray to the Father unless we know, unless that, that thing that's breaking us is our sin is taken care of. Well, how do I do that? Guys, we've read this. It's the gospel. It's Jesus Christ. It's what he has done on the cross. By accepting him, he, what, his blood actually wipes away our sin as far as the east is from the west. It's gone is what the Bible says. But it's his forgiveness. It's bowing to him and saying, God, I want to believe in you. I say, God, reveal yourself to me. Forgive me of my sins. I repent. I want to turn from my sin, and I want to turn to you, but I can't do it on my own because I need your strength. I need your power. I need you. I want your will to be done. And Holy Spirit, fill me so that I can walk in accordance to your word, to your will and not my own. I'll tell you another good litmus test is, if you're walking in this world and all you can think about is what you want or what you need or even what you desire, that's not God. That's you. And as I seek his word and I'm seeing, oh my gosh, God wants me to realize of my sinfulness and he wants me to go therefore and spread the gospel to all around. No one, no one on their own is going to go share the gospel with somebody else. No one. No one on their own is going to decide to go to Guatemala to a whole other country and go share the gospel. In fact, why would you do that? There's enough missionary, there's enough missionary work. There's people right across the street here that need the gospel. Yes, they do. But guess what? God's also calling us to Guatemala. And he's calling us to encourage those missionaries that are working there every day, all in, all out. They're giving their lives to it. And we are there to encourage them and to do a ministry to them. But guess what? I pray that this church would stop... Ju- now, praise God that we are a church that supports missionaries. By the way, if you don't know this, we, we support almost 19 missionaries throughout this, this world in this country. That's a praise. But the problem is, a lot of times, a lot of us, I'm not, I'm just, I'm saying the church as a whole, I'm not trying to just beat you or, or hurt you or make you feel bad, but I'm going to tell you, a lot of us go, here, I'll give a check to that missionary, but we're refused to go across the street and share the gospel with our neighbors. We refuse to go to HFMP and, and, and just love on people and share the gospel with people there. We, we refuse. Why do we refuse? We are called to be missionaries, every one of us. If you know the gospel, go therefore and spread the gospel because these people don't have hope like we have. If you don't see it, this world doesn't have hope. You are missing it. And maybe you're here today because you have no hope. Well, you're in the best place you can be. And maybe you're listening online because you have no hope. Oh, you're listening 
to the best thing you can hear, and that is that Jesus Christ wants to give you hope through his love, his death, and more importantly, his resurrected life, because he wants to give you that resurrection. But here's the thing. In Christ, we're just going to have part, because we have the Spirit, but one day, we're going to be complete in the redemption. Then we're going to be partying. We're going to be partying. It's not the party of the world. This is the party of the gospel, and it's an amazing party. And, and, and that's, the, that's what he's getting at. But here, it, when you don't feel it or you don't know what to do, he intercedes for you and he steps into place. And he is the one that is transforming you. So I want to pray for you today that if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you don't know this hope, if you don't see the redemption coming, I want to pray that you would open your heart to it and you would realize that it's there for you. And as the worship team comes up, I want to pray that you would, in this song, you would just maybe get real with the Lord. Maybe some of you have been walking with Jesus for a long time. And you know what? You are totally at a point of stagnant movement. There are things happening in this church. There's things happening in our school, in our small groups, in different things. And, and you know what? Some of you aren't involved because you just got used to doing what you do every day and you're not really wanting that, that tug. Because, you know, a lot of times what it is is it's easy just to not do anything. It is. But God doesn't want you to sit around and do nothing. He wants to actually encourage you to walk in him and to live in the redemption that we have today. So I want to encourage you. Pray that God would give you the heart and the, and the, and the understanding of the ministry that he's called you to because every one of us are the body of the Christ and we need you. Actually, you know what's so crazy? He used a donkey. So he really doesn't need you. But here's the best part. He wants you. He wants you. Maybe you have never accepted Jesus Christ. And today's the first day that you've said, yeah, you know what? It's time. It's time to accept Christ. Well, let's do that too. We're going to open up in this song, and this is the time we're going to continue to open up the altar, and I pray you come forth. Pray with one of us. Get real. Let's see what God can do. Father, we thank you so much for this time. I thank you for your redemptive plan. I thank you for the fact that you, the, that even creation is longing for you to return, Lord, so that it can be back to what it was meant to be. And Lord, we are longing for your return because we want to see you and be with you forever. But Lord, until that happens, we want to have a heart to go there for and spread the gospel to all that will hear. And Lord, spread the gospel in every way possible so that one day they can be longing and they can be groaning and they can see what the, the, uh, your eternal purpose is going to be in their lives. I pray for salvation today, Lord, that there will be people that will repent from their sins and they will turn to you and they will ask you to come into their lives and you will start a relationship with them, Lord, because don't, you don't want their religion. You want a relationship. And Lord, we praise you for that relationship that you want with us. And Lord, there's some of us amongst us that are just stagnant. I pray you renew their spirit in them. And each one of us will learn what it means to walk in the body of Christ. You're an amazing God, and we are so excited for our salvation. We are so excited for your return. And we are so excited to bring more people to the saving knowledge of who you are. Do a work in us, Lord Jesus. Bring someone forward today that needs you. Work in their hearts right now. If someone's online, Lord, I pray that they would just bow their heads right now and they would just ask you to come into their hearts and their lives. Work in their midst, Lord Jesus. We give you this day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The altar is open.